John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. Shall we begin? On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be the reading of his word. You may all be seated. So, I am sending you. It is always a privilege for, for me to uh, declare the word of God to dear brothers and sisters on a weekly basis in this church. It is an honor for me and a privilege for me to speak the word of truth in our midst. But from time to time, we, that joy um, is even compounded uh, by the presence of people who have been so dear to us and uh, with us from the very beginning. And this morning, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our dear elder Nick and sister Vivian Bonifacio, who is with us. For the many of us who are with us since the beginning, uh, they are our special guests, teachers, and speakers during our first anniversary of this church in March of 2016. Uh, I was telling um, Elder Nick that it was like, um, you know, uh, Timothy being visited by the Apostle Paul. <laughs> so the, the joy and the excitement are like a mixed feeling, so to speak. But it is still my joy, and I would like to claim the truth of the word as we feast on the word of God. Will you join me in prayer first? Father God, we thank you for your word. We ask that you empower your servant whom you have entrusted to speak it and may the purpose for which you have sent it be fulfilled in our midst this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We are all familiar with the Great Commission declared by the Lord Jesus as recorded in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. And I'm sure most of us know that this Great Commission is in every end of every gospel book, all four of them. Okay. And in the first opening verses of the book of Acts. All right. Uh, hindi lang po siya parehong pareho ang pagkakasabi. Subalit lahat po ng laman ng Great Commission is enveloped in all of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just once, not just twice, five times. And alam naman natin in biblical literature, when a word or statement is repeated, it is very significant. Hindi po ba? At ito po ay limang beses na binanggit. And if it is repeated more than once, it is especially important. Especially this one. Because it is a command, it is a mission call, it is a call to action. But in, in its case, there is a different emphasis, mga kapatid. No? Um, in Matthew, the emphasis is in the authority of Jesus. The authority of Jesus. Um, if you go back to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 28, we see that he is together with uh, many of his disciples, almost 500 of them, 
standing on top of the mountain in Galilee, presumably overlooking the horizon, and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay? The emphasis is on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, and rightly so, because Matthew was supposedly written originally to the Jewish people. And since these Jewish people honor and um, almost uh, consider Abraham as the founder of their faith and the uh, doer of all things, Matthew is telling them, no, he is greater than Abraham, he is greater than Moses, he is the chosen one, the long-awaited Messiah. All right? In Mark, the emphasis is on the final judgment. Mark being um, written, addressed mainly to the Romans. He said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. As we have been studying in the Gospel of John, the Romans are very um, uh, polytheistic. They, they do, uh, um, they worship a lot of gods and they worship the emperor. All right? Uh, and, and, and they have so many superstitious beliefs and, and tradition. And in Mark, he is telling the audience that Jesus is the worker of miracles, all the signs and wonders, and he is the true God. He is the true God, not your emperor, not your traditions. In Luke, the Great Commission is presented as a fulfillment of prophecy. It is written that is, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The, the Dr. Luke that we know, very meticulous, very methodical in his system of writing, wrote to the intellectual Greeks, all right? And, and he is explaining to them that their polytheistic belief, their believes in so many gods who are unknowable. He's saying, Jesus is the God-man. This is how he came to us. And he is the true God. In the sequel to the, book, uh, to the Gospel of Luke, the book of Acts presents a program of world evangelization. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and, at, and to the end of the earth. Mga kapatid, iba-iba po ang emphasis, pero iisa po ang mensahe. Jesus has prepared us. The Holy Father called us. The Spirit empowers us. And now we have a job to do. We have to proclaim him, the triune God is sending us for this mission. And these commissioning words are drawn from a variety of circumstances and were spoken to a variety of people. And yet in John's version, it is unique in the sense that it is probably the first time this command was ever expressed by Jesus to his disciples. And you know what he said? He links this commissioning of the disciples to the original commissioning of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Father. Do you understand that? The setting, brothers and sisters, is in Jerusalem. It's still on the day of the resurrection, in the evening of the resurrection, in a room that uh, some theologians would say was the same room where they had their last supper just three days before. 
because most of them are in Galilee. They are uh, originally from Galilee. Uh, so most probably the room that they had during the Last Supper, the washing of the feet of the disciples, is the same room where they were in, except that it was locked. Right? Just three days before. Well, we've studied that uh, while well, John and Peter have explained to the disciples the fact that they, that they see the undisturbed grave clothes at the tomb. And they believe in the resurrection. And, and while Mary Magdalene has told them that Jesus has told her and she has seen Jesus, these things, these disciples... You have to remember, these disciples have been so perplexed, so fearful, so anxious by what happened during that uh, previous two days. And that explains the locked doors, because they are fearful that they will get arrested. That pa that, 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 that the truth that uh, the reality of the resurrection of Jesus is still very much a... A, um, it, it, it hasn't emerged fully in them yet, okay? And, and that's the reason why the door are still locked and there are still fear of being arrested. And then suddenly, the glory of the Lord came upon them. The Lord Jesus Christ is there visibly in the midst of them. And... He introduces this commission, this great commission, with the Lord quieting their heart from anxiety and confusion with a familiar Hebrew greeting, Shalom. Shalom. Peace be with you. In the original Old Testament context, Shalom basically means well-being in its fullest sense. It gathers all the blessings of the kingdom of God. Shalom is life at its best under the gracious call of God. And Jesus, knowing the hearts and the anxiety of his disciples during that night, use it as an Easter greeting. It represented a truly authentic bestowal of peace in the history of the world. Precisely because he brought the kingdom of God into a realization by his death and his rising again. And now the word shalom, peace be with you, become a realizable blessing. Right? Dati, perfunctory lang po. Oh, peace be with you, peace be with you, no? Pero now, the Lord spoke it in a realizable blessing. It is like a, a, uh, an, a complement of the last words that he uttered before he gave his last breath on the cross. He said, it is finished. And then these words is like a complement of that. Peace be with you. And that's why it is no wonder why the Apostle Paul includes that word together with the word grace in the greetings in all of his epistles. And to further reassure the disciples that he is truly the Lord himself, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. In verse 20. And the effect of that is very much predictable. They were really overjoyed. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. It is indeed Jesus Christ. Truly the gladness of an Easter joy. Mga kapatid, no? Kaya ni-request ko po yung first song. You turned my morning into dancing. And that's exactly what happened to the disciples that night. They were so anxious. They were so fearful. And Jesus came, gave them the most 
peaceful greeting of uh, the Jews, shalom, and then showed him his hands and his side. Yes. Mga kapatid, no? yung lahat ng yung takot at uh, uh, pangamba ng mga disciples during that time would have been replaced by joyful dancing. I, I would say it is no exaggeration that they truly danced during that time. <laughs> Right. Jesus, however, has not come merely to assure them of his conquest of death and the triumph of his kingdom. He came also to instruct and prepare them for what lies ahead. Mga kapatid, the mission about which he has taught them at the upper room is now eminent. It is forthcoming and he sets them apart for it in a solemn moment of commissioning when he said, As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. He, he was actually echoing the words that he uttered in his high priestly prayer in chapter 17, verse 18. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. This is the form by which the Great Commission appears here in the Gospel of John. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And brothers and sisters, if you really think about those words and not feel so inadequate, I don't know if you are reading it right. How can I possibly be out there doing the things that the Lord is given me in the same manner that Jesus was sent by the Father to this earth? How can I? No? Ang hirap po niyan. Impossible po yan. Jesus is God in human flesh. I am not. Jesus never sinned. I often sin. Jesus walked in an unbroken, intimate relationship with the Father. I do not. And Jesus never made mistakes. I do it all the time, right? So how can I go out there and do the things that the Lord Jesus has told me to do, just like as he has, the Father has sent him to do? No? Para pong si Apostle Pablo, who can, who can be sufficient to do these things in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But praise God, mga kapatid, our text this morning, short as they are, turns this undoable mission into a doable mission precisely because although we cannot do it on our own, the Lord Jesus himself will be our sufficiency for this mission. Just like what Apostle Paul said after saying who is sufficient for all these things, he followed it up in chapter 3 when he said, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Amen. Amen. I like Brother Nick Talaga, so he compliments me uh, a lot. No? Thank you, sir. Our Lord gives us five ways, mga kapatid, gives us five ways that He equipped us so that this impossible mission becomes doable. And more than just doable, it will be successful, right? Because the reason Savior has called and equipped us, we can confidently co proclaim the gospel to all people. And the first thing that He empowers us with, that He equipped us with, is our recent Savior has given us peace. We read that in verse 19 and in verse 21. Mga kapatid, keep in mind that these men who had led, um, who had been following Jesus for three years, all fled in fear for their own lives when Jesus was arrested. Peter himself denied the Lord three times. 
they all doubted the initial reports that Jesus has resurrected even. Okay? It would certainly be understandable if Jesus came in that upper room, that locked room, and say, See, I told you. Diba? But he did not say that. He, rather than rebuking them, the Lord graciously extended to them and underscored the peace to them. That's the first power that he has given to us. Peace with God is foundational for our mission for him. We cannot begin to serve the Lord unless we are first reconciled to him through the peace that Christ accomplished on the cross. Before you believe in Christ, as Pastor Jared mentioned to us in, in the uh, opening uh, prayer, we are alienated from God. We are hostile to God. We don't submit to Him in Romans chapter 8. But when you trust, when we trust in Christ, we enter a new relationship of peace with God. Then and only then, God appoints us to be ambassadors for His mission of reconciliation to this world which is hostile to toward him okay not only does christ give us a peace of god or peace with god through his blood but he also gives us the peace of god through his abiding presence with us as we seek to accomplish the mission statement that he has given to to us as Jesus concluded the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he gave the assurance and say, I am with you, what? Always, right? I am with you always, even to the end of the age. As we proclaim the gospel to this hostile world, the Lord's presence gives us the peace of God which surpasses all understanding Philippians 4 7 and the peace that the Lord gives also extends to our relationships with one another no? um, it, it, it's, it's sad that uh, one of the experiences I had when we were working in Vietnam so many of the missionaries were there and a lot of them come back home not because they, they were tired of preaching the gospel. They were tired of just the people criticizing and um, making uh, things very difficult for them. Okay? Fellow workers in the church. Even churches have conflicts. Amen? <laughs> churches have conflicts. Internal conflicts. A a and we need the peace of the Lord extended to our relationship with one another. And when churches get into internal conflicts, our witness is negatively affected. And that's why it makes, it makes all the more difficult for us to witness into the world because they see us fighting against each other. That's why many passages in the New Testament exhort us to work a peaceful relationship with one another as Paul said with reference to the deep divide between the Jews and the Gentiles in Ephesians chapter 2 he said for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall Christ has given us peace with God the peace of God and the peace with one another uh, so, that, that, that should be enough to carry our mission, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is that our recent Savior showed us convincing proof of himself in John chapter 20, verse 20. Look again at your bulletin or your Bible in, chap in verse 20. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They were glad to see that indeed Jesus resurrected from the grave. 
And during our home fellowship group this week, uh, one of our um, attendees asked the question, how will we look like when we have our own resurrected body? Huh? Huh? Um, gone are the warts and all the blemishes and the imperfection of our body. No? And, and Kuya Lito said, I'd like to be in my 25 um, in my age 25 when I'm resurrected, all right? Sab kasi yun daw yung pinakagwapo niyang uh, version of himself, no? Yeah? But, but when I'm studying this text, I said to myself, huh? wow, yeah. We will all be unblemished and untarnished. Warts and all gone. All the paint gone. And you know why? Because the Lord Jesus is still carries those scars on his hand and on his side. Even now, his resurrected body is still show the nail-pierced hands and his side, seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. We will be unblemished and the most guapo uh, during our resurrected bodies because Jesus carried all in his body, the scars of our sin. On that first resurrection Sunday, Jesus showed his hands and side to convince them of the truth that he was Reason bodily. And Luke narrated in his gospel, you know, if you come back to chapter 24 in Luke, he even asked for a broiled fish to have breakfast, and he ate this fish while watch this um, in the presence of all these disciples that evening. That historical fact, brothers and sisters, should be at the center of our witness for Christ, okay? And, and, and while it is true that Jesus can, can solve our problems or can, can heal broken relationship, while it is true that Jesus can restore uh, our health, that, that is not the core message of the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus died for our sins and he was raised again according to the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In other words, mga kapatid, when you witness to your friends and neighbors, don't insist upon them that when they believe, they will have all their problems solved. Because that is not true. Sometimes in his sovereign will and power, the Lord doesn't heal. So what happened? Bagsak na yung paniniwala nila. Ano po? Believe in Jesus because you are a sinner and he is the only Savior and he is risen from the dead and he is coming again to judge na. Hindi na po siya uh, gagawa ng iba but he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. And we can proclaim the gospel with confidence because we have a great proof of that resurrection. Because he resurrected, we will also be. Okay? And there is proof of that. It is a historical fact. The third thing that the Lord empowers us in this text is that the recent Savior gave us the same purpose as he's in John chapter 20, verse 21. He said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. As I mentioned earlier, this, this commissioning actually applies already what the Lord has already prayed previously in chapter 17 in his highly priestly prayer. As you sent me into the world, he's praying to the Father, I also sent them into the world. 
John's gospel frequently emphasizes the theme of Jesus being sent by the Father. Yan po yung emphasis ng Panginoon. I am sent by the Father to do the will of the Father. I am sent by the Father to speak the words of the Father. And I stand before you to perform the works of the Father. All of this in the whole Gospel of John which we have studied before. He was sent to bring salvation to the world. Jesus taught us to pray. Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He came to establish the Father's kingdom by bringing people under his lordship to do his will. And by sending us in the same way that he was sent, you know what? His purpose becomes our purpose. We should live in obedience to Christ and teach others to do the same. That is why we emphasize walking like Jesus walked. 1 John 2.6, okay? But often, churches collectively and individually lose sight of our purpose. We are always distracted by other things. Okay, so many things to be done and for the sake of convenience, okay, we, we, we don't consider doing as the Lord has done. I was thinking it would have been a lot easier if we instill a policy in BCI Marikina uh, that we only accept Christian children and children of Christian families. That would be convenient. That, that would be a cop-out, mga kapatid. We have always believed that the school is an extension of the mission of CBCM. Without the church mission, BCI will lose its purpose. And that is the reason why we continue to welcome students and uh, children of unbelievers in our, ch in our school. And yes, it would give us the risk of danger of having unbelieving children and or unbelieving parents who may knowingly or unknowingly influence our community with their foul language from time to time or unchristian behavior. But that's our mission. And we exist because BCI wants to nurture and inspire our children to become the best versions of themselves as God wants them to be. And, and, and what is that? What is that best, best version? It's Christ-likeness, hindi po ba? Yan po yung mission ng school and that is also the mission of the church. If we, as a church of Jesus Christ here in Community Bible Church, if we decide to ban anyone who does not subscribe to our reform doctrines, or if we make them feel unwelcome because we are afraid that they will contaminate the church, how, how then will these people see what Christ's likeness would be? What is the use of our intensive training of basic discipleship and basic Bible doctrines and basic leadership if we avoid contact with lost people. If Jesus was known as a friend of sinners, and he said in Luke 5.32, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, should we not do the same to our neighbors and our friends and our schoolmates and our office mates? If Jesus' purpose was to seek and save the lost, Shouldn't that be our purpose too? Mga kapatid, he gave us a great commission which is the same as his. His purpose is our purpose. To tell people the good news about the eternal life and the greatest purpose that anyone can have because that is our Savior's purpose. So the Lord Jesus Christ gave us peace 
he gave us a convincing proof of his resurrection and he gave us a sense of purpose which is his purpose right the fourth point is that the risen savior has given us great power in verse 22 and when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them receive the holy spirit we have always time and again emphasized that to attempt to serve the lord in any capacity but especially in proclaiming the gospel to the lost Doing it without relying on the power of the Holy Spirit would be futile, would be meaningless, would be without power. Okay? As Zechariah 4 6 reminds us, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Some Bible scholars um, I read in the commentaries re wrestled with the exact meaning of this verse in the light of a subsequent outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Sabi nila, bakit may ganun? Eh, ginawa ng Panginoon yan collectively um, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, well, uh, there are many theologians who are not... Um, agreeing uh, as they always do uh, on, on verses of the of a scripture at last like this but I tend to believe this event is not inferior to Acts chapter 2 it is not just a symbolic effect on the disciples that evening kung titingnan po natin I, I, I believe this action of the Lord Jesus Christ here in this particular evening is an impartation of the spirit of the holy spirit to strengthen the disciples in the coming 40 days of his teaching yan po yung paniniwala ko it is an impartation of the strengthening of the disciples to the next 40 days that jesus would teach them and clarify to them the truth that he had been expounding to the disciples particularly to the 12 during his three years of earthly ministry. Wag po natin kalilimutan, even though he has been teaching them for three years, many of the things that he has discussed and taught them about, particularly heaven and eternal life, has been so vague to them. But in this last 40 days, 40 days of his stay, you know they understood. We know that some of them even wrote it in the New Testament, hindi po ba? Clearly. And I believe that that's the reason why the, the Lord Jesus Christ gave them an impartation, a special impartation of the Holy Spirit for them to be prepared to hear once again and clarified once again on the things that the Lord Jesus taught them. This is not a secondary or inferior uh, blessing you also remember that this this is a time when the 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 disciples would be revived after their failure remember when the, the lord jesus christ was arrested all of them fled all of them uh, went away they did not show themselves except john Prior to resurrection, they all succumbed to failure. And they all felt, with the exception of perhaps a few, that they all failed the Lord. But when we look at Acts chapter 1, the beginning of the ministry of the disciples, they are all empowered, gathered together with one mind, devoting themselves to prayer and eagerly awaiting the promised Holy Spirit to come. And that unity and fervent prayer, um, I believe that may be attributed to this specific impartation of the Holy Spirit by the Lord Jesus Christ. We all know that when we receive the, whole, the, the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts, believe and put our faith, it, it speaks of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? 
But at the same time, if we are to impart and proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ to our neighbors and friends, we need the constant infilling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts because we can grieve the Holy Spirit. His manifest presence in our hearts will, will not be shown because of sin in our hearts. And that's why we need the constant infilling of the Holy Spirit. Although the Bible never commands us to baptize, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit because that is a, a, a one-time action that takes place at the moment of salvation, He commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. And since the Spirit of God must open the blind eyes and impart new life to sinners when they hear the gospel, we must especially rely on the infilling of the Holy Spirit to talk about the Lord. Amen? So the Lord Jesus Christ is, has equipped us in proclaiming the gospel by giving us his peace, by giving us a solid proof of his resurrection, the purpose for which we are existing in this world, and a great power by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, the risen Savior gave us an unmistakable message. Look again at your Bible in verse 23, chapter 20 of John. He said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Again, um, I, I, I uh, risk repeating myself. The ultimate reason of the mission of the church in this world is to deal with sin. We don't excuse ourselves in preaching about sin. Dito sa ating church, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus died to save us from just wrath of God against our rebellion and our sin. Let us not lose sight of this intended goal of the verse. Mga kapatid, no? yan ang intended goal of that verse when the Lord said that. Kaya lang po, um, dito sa ating uh, community, uh, marami pa po talaga yung uh, mga katoliko. Ano po? At, at um, in fact, most of, all, most of us, if not all of us, came from that, that, um, that um, organization, that religion. More than 80% of the Philippines is still Roman Catholic. The problem was that the Roman Catholic Church used that verse, John 20, 23, to support their beliefs of some false doctrines that they have instituted and which I need to address this morning also. They interpret this verse verse 23 to mean that ordained priests have authority to forgive or retain the sins of people who come to them in secret confession, confessional box and penance. Ano po? Yan po yung turo sa atin ng ating uh, Roman Catholic Church. And, and most of us know that they base this doctrine on three beliefs. One, there is an apostolic succession in the Roman Catholic Church through Peter and the Pope. Number two, there is a distinction between the clergy and the laity. And number three, which is the worst um, teaching of all, is that in order to be forgiven of sins, you have to do penance. And you can, you can only do that um, with a priest, with an ordained priest. And he will give you, um, you know, seven, um, the Lord's Prayer, recite Hail Mary for ten times because your sins are many. Things like that. Let, let, let me um, clarify why, why we believe 
that these principles or doctrines is, is false. Okay? Just, just to make it clear for many of us who still have been um, in the, um, in, in our system, is still our beliefs in the Roman Catholic Church. First, there is no biblical warrant for apostolic succession. None. None at all. Although we know in Ephesians chapter 2 that the Lord Jesus Christ has given authority to the apostles to found the church. Okay? He, he found, they all founded the church together with the apostle Paul. Right? That, that is true. Uh, the Lord has given them that authority. But once the church was founded, that authority ceases. There is no more apostle today. Right? The, the New Testament is clear also that, that there is no distinction between ordained clergy and the laity. While here in the Philippines, I don't know about the U.S., but in the Philippines, it is a legal requirement for a leader of a church to be ordained because uh, that, would, that would give them the license to officiate wedding. They give them the license to officiate um, family mediation and, and things like that for official legal purpose. But the Bible is very clear. While there is warrant for ordaining men to ministry, it does not make them mediators between God and man. Jesus is the only mediator. Amen? Amen. po, 1 Timothy 2.5 All believers are priests before God. CBCM as well as all other um, evangelical churches believe in the priesthood of all believers with equal access to his throne of grace. Otherwise, there will be no 1 Peter 2.9, where he has declared us to be a chosen nation, a royal people, a holy priesthood, a people for his own possession, who are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are all priests. I mean, in the, in the sense of, of the word. Although in the Philippines, talaga pong may mga legal prerequisites that had to be fulfilled before you can do certain things. But that's only for legal. In the eyes of God, all of us are priests. Number three, only God can forgive sin. Ano po? Maliwanag na maliwanag yan. When, when he forgive our sin the instant that we repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, automatic po yun. Ano po, pinagkalooban tayo ng Panginoon ng kapatawaran sa ating mga kasalanan. And worse, to add penance as a necessary thing for forgiveness is like adding works to the salvation, the free grace that the Lord has given us in his finished work on that cross. As we have repeatedly told our people, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that we have contributed to our saving uh, grace. It is all Jesus Christ. From the calling, from the election, up to the justification, up to the redemption and the regeneration, it's all by God. The triune God did it all. We did not do anything else, right? Yeah. Amen. And lastly, there is no example in the Bible of the apostles forgiving or retaining the sins of anyone. This is very important, brothers and sisters, because this is a, um, a very important principle in Bible interpretation. There is no instance in, in the Bible that anyone has ever forgiven the sins or even retained the sins of anyone. And, and that's the example that I would like to, 
to uh, give to you is the example of Acts chapter 10, when Simon the magician followed the group of Peter and seeing them doing all these works of healing people and, and declaring forgiveness of their sins, oh, he said, my goodness, I would like to have that also. And although he, he is already in, in the Bible, you can read that he was already a believer. No, but believer in the sense of believing the works that disciples have been doing. And so what he did is he is offering money. He offered money to Peter in order for him to get that same gift. And Peter rebuked him. He said, you are still in your sins. And that proves to us that he was not a believer of Jesus Christ yet. Because Peter declared that you are still in your sins. Okay? And maski po si Apostle Pablo, uh, the great apostle of the New Testament, no? ang galing-galing po niyang mag-mentor ng kanyang mga uh, protege. And that's why I, men I mentioned earlier that I, I'm like um, Timothy uh, being visited by Paul. Right? Because Paul, if indeed there is a command to him to forgive and to retain the sins of people, then he would have told Timothy and even Titus to do the same. Because he, if, if not, then he is missing a lot of the commands of the Lord. An, an important one. Right? But he did not do that. Did not. There was no record in the Bible that any apostle has given forgiveness and retention of the sins of anyone. So, the correct meaning and application for us of this verse, I believe, is this. Based on what Jesus Christ our Lord has said in the words of his scriptures, we, followers of Jesus Christ, we have the authority to proclaim to those who repent and to those who believe in Christ that your sins are forgiven. We, we have the authority to proclaim that. Or if a person hardens his heart and refuses to believe, we can solemnly proclaim to them, your sins are still in there. You are still in your sins. Okay? In short, we declare it as truth. We proclaim the authority of the Lord to forgive or retain our sin. We do not grant or retain forgiveness. Amen? We don't do that. This act is solely the prerogative of God, which He clearly said in His Word. No? Yan po ang talagang katotohanan yan. So our conclusion is that our mission is to proclaim the forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ to all, to all who will believe. And that mission is possible. Although it is impossible for us in our own strength, it is possible because the risen Savior has equipped us with the peace, a solid proof that He is indeed alive. He has given us the purpose, which is the same purpose as we have. He has given us the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to unregenerate people. And lastly, He has given us an unmistakable message. That same, that same equipping that the Lord Jesus Christ imparted to the disciples on the evening of the first Resurrection Sunday is given to us today. We have that same equipping. We cannot keep the good news to ourselves, brothers and sisters. We cannot. The very purpose by which the Lord Jesus Christ has given us those equipping is for us to put it into practice and to put it into use. We have a job to do. We have a job to do. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you.
We thank you, Lord, for such a wonderful assurance. Amen. And we ask that you impart to us the truth, not just in our heads, but in our hearts. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for that wonderful gift of eternal life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.